lot of you guys probably know me for that, but um, I've actually, my early background is actually is in AI. Um, so kind of tell you a little bit about, you know, what I did there. Um, and it is this uh, image that I generated uh, from ChatGPT and said, just give me an image for a talk like this. And it not only generated that image, but it like explained to me like the thought behind it and that like this is, you know, transitioning from like an industrial age to a more, uh, you know, AI uh, world, you know, going from left to right. So it's pretty amazing uh, what, what this generative AI is, is, is able to do nowadays. But yeah, so, you know, my background in AI kind of goes way back. Um, my first course uh, I had in AI was uh, something called Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence back in when I was a freshman in college in 1984. Uh, it was a really interesting topic and I remember writing a paper at the time saying like what would like the you know professor asked like what do you think would be like one of the hardest things for AIs to do and I said it would be like for it to understand the tone of voice with which a person is talking. I thought that would be a really hard thing to do but now you look at those uh, videos that chat you know, the open AI people are putting out there and it's just like, okay, we, we're there, you know. Uh, it's not a big deal anymore. And then I had this other course, uh, which was a survey of what's happening in, in the AI field at the time. Um, they brought in a lot of different speakers. Um, we had um, John Hopfield, who's known for the Hopfield Network and even Jeffrey Hinton and uh, various other, you know, AI luminaries at the time. So I, I was like, and you know, this was my senior year, and I was really, really fascinated by AI, and um, you know, really wanted to pursue that. So, um, you know, that that's kind of like you know some of my early starts in that. And then when I joined um, NASA, uh, they actually had a conference. Um, it was called the Vision Twenty One Symposium that they organized, and. They invited a lot of really very interesting people to that symposium, and one of them was uh, Werner Vinge, who is the guy who actually coined the term singularity. Like you know, you hear hear the word singularity a lot now, and uh, Ray Kurzweil talking about how the singularity is near. But this was the conference where he first gave his talk about the technological singularity, and. This was in 1993, and he, he, you know, here he says, like, within 30 years, we will have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence, and shortly after, the human era will have ended. <laughs> and so, here we are, 30 years later, and we're seeing that happen, right? I mean, uh, I would say these, you know, large language models and uh, that you know, companies are putting out now they are more intelligent than any one human, right? Like, you could ask that one model a topic of just about anything, right? Like, I, I, I have it translate Hindi songs, right? And it can do those translations, like, phenomenally, right? I mean, uh, it, you can ask it about whatever topic you want, pretty much, but it, it knows that. I even asked it, like, who's Omar Syed? And he said, oh. Omar Syed uh, is the guy who invented the Arima board game, you know. So it's like, how do you know all these obscure things, right? Like, of course, it, you know, went on Wikipedia and collected all that knowledge and everything. Um, but, yeah, so this is really, you know, we're, we're here. <laughs> and, you know, it's happening. Uh, we've been talking about this for decades, and now it's finally starting to happen. Um, and in, in 1995, I, you know, um, submitted my uh, master's thesis and it was actually on applying uh, genetic algorithms to evolve recurrent neural networks for learning like the network parameters and architecture. Um, so, so that was, you know, like I, you know, after I finished my bachelor's, I was really interested in AI, went back and did my master's in that. And I was really, really deep into this stuff <laughs> uh, back in like in the 1990s. And I was, you know, when I did my master's, I was really fascinated by 
what it could do. Um, like, so one of the things that I, you know, had, had the AI do at that time was to develop this, um, basically evolve a small uh, neural network brain that could control a cart which was balancing a pole on, on the cart. So, you know, like if you've ever tried to balance a stick on your hand, you know, like how difficult that is. Um, but, you know, so that was an interesting problem. And we were able to actually evolve neural networks that could balance this, this pole. And it would just, you know, move the cart left and right to make sure that the pole would stay balanced and then bring it back to the center of the table. And I remember after doing that, I was, you know, kind of quibbling, like, what won't this be able to do, you know, eventually? Um, and I knew that, you know, I had a pretty good hint, hunch that this is going to impact, you know, jobs in the future. And, you know, there's going to be a lot more automation uh, coming up. And I remember going home one night and telling my brother that, hey, you know, I think we're all going to be living on welfare one day. Uh, but what I really meant by that is that, you know, we're going to need to desubsidize somehow because we might not have jobs anymore. Um, and, and so, you know, I've been kind of thinking about this for a while. And now, like, more and more people are also starting to think the same thing, you know. Um, and it, this is just go out there and search the news. It, it is a hot topic right now. Like, how is AI going to impact the jobs? And what's going to happen to the job market? You know, what job should you do so you don't get affected and all that, right? So this is a really hot topic right now. Um, but this is something that, you know, some people have been thinking about for a long time. And, I, you know, there, a lot of people kind of get scared and worried about that, but I actually have a positive view on that. Um, and, but, you know, the thing is not everyone agrees that um, this is going to, be so bad, like, uh, you know, like, they, they don't think AI is going to replace all the jobs or, uh, you know, uh, humans will still be having to do things. And, you know, they're probably, there, there's a good reason to believe that they're right, because, you know, history has sh shown us that, you know, uh, there's been a lot of automation done in the past, and, you know, it's actually created more jobs, uh, not the not the same job that the people were doing, but actually probably better jobs, right? Like less mundane jobs. And so, you know, time and again, ever since the industrial age, you know, uh, we've been bringing more and more automation and that automation has not eliminated jobs and we're, you know, all still working. And, uh, you know, if you want to work, you can find a job. So, um, you know, that it's, it's good reason to believe that that's what will happen again with this new uh, AI revolution. But, you know, I, I personally think that, you know, this time it's different. Um, and, you know, we've kind of started to become complacent and assume that, you know, it will continue to be like, okay, there's going to be jobs, doesn't matter if, you know, we automate more. But this time I think it's, it's really quite different. Um, you know, the, the wolf is actually here now. Uh, so, um, and, and the reasons for that is because we're now actually have AIs that are reaching human performance, right? And initially, you know, you can see that in some of the intellectual tasks, right? Like these AIs are able to pass all, all these tests and, um, you know, generative AIs able to create all these images that are made for this thing, just, you know, in a short amount of time. Um, and so all these intellectual tasks are going to get, you know, taken up by AI. And companies are always looking to cut costs. So obviously, you know, if they can cut costs and do it, do it faster and cheaper with AI, they're going to do that. And then slowly over time, the more physical tasks will also uh, start to get taken over as we get like the, you know, the, the, um, humanoid type robots that can actually walk around and carry out tasks and things like that. And, you know, if you've ever watched that movie, I Robot, uh, you know, you could see what that world is like if you have all these uh, robots walking around and um, 
living side by side with uh, people. So, you know, it's um, it's it's going to be a very different world. And 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 when this really starts to take off, is when you get to the point where these robots and AIs can create the next generation of robots and AIs. And that's when, you know, it, it really takes off, and then pretty soon you don't need any human intervention involved in that loop anymore. So um, it's, it's going to be very transformative. So what are the jobs that are going to be impacted? And, you know, people are maybe looking to see, like, okay, what isn't going to get impacted so I can, you know, focus on that? Um, well, initially... Uh, the white collar jobs, I think, are going to be the most impacted, right? So, like already, like writing, art, music, um, even programming. <laughs> you know, I, I, I never thought I'd see the day where I could just like take, you know, a description of what I want done and just put it into this AI, and out comes the program. Like I, you know, like I hire people for our companies and. We used to give a programming test, and after ChatGPT came out, I took my test, and I literally just copied and pasted that, and it spit out a program to, uh, you know, build a client and server program in Node.js that can play tic-tac-toe, where, you know, you can, where in the client, each player, you know, enters their move, goes back to the server, and server sends that move to the next player, and so on. It did all of that just from my English description that I used to give to people. And that test you would take people about two to three hours to do. This did it in like under a minute, right? So <laughs> I could just spit out the code. So um, this is really changing things like never before. Um, of course, you know, customer service jobs like AIs are able to talk to people and I think a lot of people, uh, I'm looking forward to having uh, AIs do customer support <laughs> uh, so that I don't have to, you know, deal with, uh, uh, and get faster service too, that way, right? So um, teachers, lawyers, doctors, I think even judges and politicians, all of this is gone. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we probably won't need presidents anymore in the future. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> and so... Yeah, and then the next thing, you know, the, the actually the blue-collar jobs are probably where you want to be because that's uh, going to be a little bit harder to replace, um, you know, like actual uh, doing things physically. That's It's going to be a little bit more uh, complex to do that, but there will be another chat GPT moment for that when, you know, who knows, maybe when uh, Tesla releases their uh, humanoid robot or figure or one of these companies puts out something that just blows away what we thought was possible. Um, and then at, the, at that point, you know, we're just all going to be like, okay, what there is, you know, we're all going to be convinced that there's nothing that these systems can't do that humans can do. Um, and over a matter of like 25 years, I don't think it really matters what we, you know, uh, think is not going to be replaced. It's eventually going to get replaced. So, um, so where, where would humans get their income from at that time, right? Like we're also used to this concept of, you know, doing a job to make a living and so on. Now, if, if you're not able to sell your labor anymore, nobody wants to buy human labor, where do all the humans go, right? Like we don't have any source of income. So here's, here's the thing, though. Like I, I don't think we have to be really too worried about that. I think what will happen is that, Jobs will be, even though you may not be able to get a job, there will eventually be some sort of a universal basic income that's provided to everybody. And that will provide enough sustenance so that, like, you know, uh, you're not going hungry or, um, you know, having to uh, do crazy things. Um, but, you know, the thing is, if you think about the overall picture, um, there are actually a lot of people right now who don't work, right? Like, because maybe they have other sources of income. There, there's already people living in that, uh, even now, right? Um, they have, like, businesses or they have assets that have appreciated. They're maybe getting dividends from their 
you know, investments and they have rental income and royalties and inheritances. So there's lots of different sources of income that we have and all those will be there. The only one that's going to be changing is jobs where you sell your time and labor in exchange for money. And, you know, uh, UBI, I think, is going to, to change that. And you know, there's a lot of people now talking about UBI. Uh, in fact, uh, like all of the CEOs of the AI companies are, you know, talking about like how we need to have uh, some sort of a, a universal basic income as we, you know, move into this era um, of, uh, of AIs uh, replacing human work. So, but where's, where's that UBI going to come from, right? So uh, initially, um, you know, I think maybe we might have corporate taxes uh, be able to pay that. In fact, uh, I don't know if you guys remember um, in the 2020 election, there was Andrew Yang who ran for president. Um, and, you know, his main platform was that, hey, you know, all these companies are uh, making a lot of money uh, through automation and AI, and uh, we should just tax that and use that to give like $1,000 a month to every citizen. And so, you know, that, that may be one way to do it. Uh, but there's also, you know, these things coming up called central bank digital currencies, uh, CBDCs, uh, where every individual now directly has an account with the Federal Reserve. And Federal Reserve, as you know, is the entity that creates money, right? Like, so the way it works now, this is a whole other topic I could go on with this, but, um, you know, the way it works now is the, f the Federal Reserve creates money, you know, essentially goes to the government, and then the government, you know, dishes that out. But we don't have to just only create money at the top. The Federal Reserve could also create a UBI at the bottom where each individual gets some new money right, like what they kind of did with the stimulus checks that were passed out during COVID, right? Like, where did all that money come from? Uh, yeah, it just gets created. Um, so we could have a UBI given by an entity like the Federal Reserve. But we also, you know, how to have to, I think, rethink about how money works. And, you know, people are starting to do that with, and, and cryptocurrencies are starting to help us rethink how money works. And we could have a world where we have a decentralized public monetary system. Um, I actually have a proposal for one, it's called Globalville. Um, but other people are also working on this. Um, uh, Sam Altman, who's the um, you know, CEO of uh, OpenAI, he actually has another project called WorldCoin, which I think is a little bit uh, draconian because they kind of have to like scan your retina to give you a UBI. Um, but then there's also um, another project called uh, Good Dollar from uh, the founder of uh, eToro. Um, and so some people are thinking about this and uh, I think it'll happen one way or another. Um, you know, we will have UBI. And, but then you have to think like, okay, so what are humans going to do in that kind of an era? Like you don't have to go to work, right? Uh, and you're getting this steady income of a UBI. Uh, what are you gonna do with your time? Like, you know, one, one of the things that people are saying is that we're starting to finally realize that maybe um, work is something that, uh, you know, uh, people want to maybe do even if they don't have to do it, uh, just so that they feel like they're occupied and have, um, you know, some meaning in life. But you know, if you go back and think about it, this concept of jobs wasn't there, you know, like 500 years ago or in the prophet of time or in, 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 the, in the times of the prophet and things like that. People were self-sustained, right? Like you worked uh, for yourself and you, um, you know, uh, grew your own food and took care of your own animals and all these things. And you weren't dependent on somebody to give you an income. Um, you just, you know, traded and interacted with people and you did things on your own. So we need to think about going back to that. And, you know, we ha we'll have a lot of time and, you know, people will be able to learn things. And, and learning is different than education. Education is when you learn 
to go use that to, to do a job. But learning is when you have, you know, satisfy your curiosity and you just want to become more knowledgeable. Uh, you know, people will have like, you know, games, hobbies, the metaverse, and, and new things will get created that we don't, we haven't thought of. And, um, you know, there'll be lots of things to do. And of course, you know, if you practice your religion, uh, that will be an, a big, you know, area that you can devote your time to. So, um, and so I think, you know, in the future, I, I have a very positive outlook on how things will go. Um, we may not want to go back to a world where we want where we have to go do a job. Um, you know, everyone will have their basic necessities satisfied. Uh, there'll be less inequality in the world, and everybody will have more leisure time to do what they really want to do. Um, and I think the world will be a much better place. So, uh, but it could go in bad ways too. So. Uh, but we, you know, but it's, it's, you know, we, we're here, we're on the stage right now, and the efforts that we make will determine what the future comes out to be like. So if we all think in a positive way and work towards that, that's, inshallah, how things will be. Yeah, let's. You know, uh, so I. That's that's uh, that's an interesting thing. I, I was asking my daughter. She's like ten years old, and I said, you, you know, like, hey, you know, people think that um, once uh, AI comes up, uh, it's going to replace humanity. And she said, no, it won't do that. It'll like us because we created it. Um, you know, and so uh, yeah. I mean, actually, you know, uh, things that are. As you have more intelligence, you, you also get more empathy and things like that. So who, who knows? I mean, I think these AIs could be like even more empathetic and um, they, they don't have to be like so draconian as we make them out to be. It really depends on what you train them with, right? Like what is the data? I mean, I, I don't think what they're doing now is really a good idea. Just like scrape the whole internet and just feed that in. But if you train these AIs based on like, you know, books and good literature and things like that and give them a, um, a good constitution like what uh, Anthropic is doing, they'll actually be good AIs, so. I mean, we have to look at the future and say, what do we want to do? <laughs> well, yeah, but what data do you expose it to, right? So, you know, just like your kids, right? You don't just let them surf the internet. Uh, you want them to, you know, see the g only the good stuff on the internet, right? So we have to think that way about these AIs as well. Assalamualaikum. Eventually, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, but as long as you have control over your kids, you know, you. Uh, Assalamualaikum. A uh, couple of quick uh, comments and for your thoughts also. Number one, that the uh, the abundance of uh, resources that, that you mentioned, that sounds like a Disney movie that came out like a few years ago. Where everybody was lazy and kind of just laying in bed and stuff like that. Oh, Wally, <laughs> I think you're Wally, talking about. Wally, yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, second, I, I think the, uh, the the concept of UBI. Do you think that if, if that's pegged with inflation, that'll be more worthwhile? No, actually, you can have UBI without inflation. Um, but it depends on how you structure your currency. Um, so there's a, a thing called demorage that you can apply to a currency, which basically removes a certain supply of the currency. It's, it, you can think of it like a currency tax, right? So if you have you know, X amount of money in your account, uh, a small percentage of it is automatically deducted, right? So you can have your UBI, but you can have demorage on the total currency amount, so you don't have to have inflation or deflation. It could be a very well uh, managed equilibrium of money supply okay. that's proportional to the number of participants. Excuse me? Oh yeah, good question. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll send you uh, that. I don't really have it um, 
It's not like I mean, if you hunt around for it, you'll find it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link for it. Yeah. Yeah. 